Hey there, church. Grace and peace to you in the name of Christ, and welcome to our time of worship today at Guilford College United Methodist Church. We're grateful not only for those of you who've been part of our congregation for a long time for joining us today, but we're also thankful for any of you who may be new to us or who have found us online, and we hope this time will be a blessing for you. We're very excited today because today is the first Sunday that we welcome our wonderful new associate pastor, Reverend Susan Suarez Webster, in worship. And a little bit later in our service today, we're going to be sharing in a, an order and liturgy of welcome for her as a congregation. So we hope you look forward to joining us in that. We also are excited that next Sunday afternoon after worship, um, we're planning on having a, a kind of Zoom online reception for Pastor Susan um, on Sunday afternoon at 2 p.m., where you can click through your computer and have a chance to meet her and hear her talk about herself and ask questions. And so we hope you'll plan to join us for that next Sunday and that you'll look for that by email this coming week. As we do gather in worship today, we're mindful of how grateful we are for all the ways that God is providing for us through this time. And so we're grateful for your continued support of our congregation, financial and otherwise, with your time and by sharing your gifts. And we're also grateful for the ways that you continue to support and pray for and care for one another. We do want to remind you in that spirit this week to be in prayer for those in our congregation who are experiencing a time of struggle. And in particular this week, we continue to remember the family of our dear sister in Christ, Jackie Fireball, following her passing last week. Um, we hope you might join us for the online memorial service for Jackie that will take place this afternoon. We also pray for um, folks in our church who are sick or who have family members who are sick. I'd like to ask your prayers today for the mother of Gloria Brown, who is our finance director. Gloria's mother has been hospitalized this last week with an illness. We also have a number of folks in our congregation who have some surgeries or tests that are upcoming this week, and we ask you to remember them and to reach out to support them. In particular, we ask your prayers for Diane Derrick as she prepares for her knee surgery for Sandra Myers, for Mary Jane Gordon, for Pat Gunn, and also for Scott Allen, who is going to have some important tests and results this coming week. We're all connected with one another, and when one part of the body suffers, we all suffer with it. And so thank you for suffering with and loving these, your brothers and sisters in Christ. Now let us continue in a spirit of worship as we praise God with our opening hymn, God of Wonders. Hey friends, I bet you'll remember this song from Bible school last year. It's called God of Wonders. So stand and join me as we sing and do the motions today. Lord of all creation, of water, earth, and sky.
Good morning. My name is Julie Young, and I would like to offer a morning prayer for us this morning here at Guilford College United Methodist Church. Would you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the gift of this earth that you created for us. We thank you for the beauty and all the things that you've created for us to enjoy. We ask that you be with us this day as we worship. Maybe not together, but we all are here to worship and to learn from you. May you send your spirit throughout all of us, guide and direct us and teach us the things that you want us to learn. Be with us this day throughout this service and thank you for your love and your grace and your mercy. For it is in your son's holy, precious name that we pray. Amen. Good morning, everyone. It's good to be with you today. Jordan and I have enjoyed a walk this morning already and enjoying the out of doors and God's beautiful creation. We've enjoyed um, birds and flowers and other animals and other people this morning as we've walked. And it's just made me think about the beauty of God's creation and the beauty of the out of doors. Specifically, the beauty of how God created each of us and how he created us because he loves us and he wants to be in a relationship with us. He gave us the responsibility to take care of the world and he promises to be with us each and every day. And we can see through the Bible and through the lives of all of the people in, in the Bible's history how God was faithful in being with them. We see that God was faithful and was with Abraham when God sent Abraham to a new home. God was with Moses when Moses helped the Israelites be freed from Egyptian slavery. God was with Noah when, Noah, when God gave Noah instructions on how to build an ark to save his family and all of the animals. God was with Mary when God told her that she would give birth to God's one and only son, Jesus. God was with the disciples when they followed Jesus and performed miracles. God was with Jesus when Jesus died on the cross and God's power brought him back to life three days later. And today God is still with us. And just like all of these people, we too are the same in that we don't know exactly what will happen each and every day in our lives. And that can cause us sometimes to worry or be anxious. But God is with us every single day. And he promises us in scripture, in the Bible, to not be anxious, to not worry, but to turn to him, to trust him, to pray, and believe and have faith that God will provide everything we need because of his great love for us. I, I want to encourage us this week. I want to encourage you guys to, to go and find some craft supplies. Clay or wood or sticks or rocks or paper or crayons, Play-Doh, whatever you can find. And make a creation. It will be unique and special and different from anyone else's. Just like we are special and unique from anyone else. And every time you look at that creation this week and from now on, I hope it will be a reminder to you of how much God loves you, how special and unique you are to Him, and how God promises to be with you each and every day through everything that life brings our way. And as a bonus, if you'll take a picture of your creation with your flat Jesus, and send it to our Gmail account that we sent to you already, then we'll post that on our church's Facebook page so that we can share with everyone 
how God takes care of all of creation and what you and Jesus are doing together today. Let's pray together. Almighty and gracious and loving God, we thank you for the beautiful outdoors and we thank you for all of your magnificent creation. Thank you, God, for creating us. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for being with us in every situation in life. Help us to remember that you are indeed with us. Help us to not be anxious, to turn to you, and to trust you. We thank you for your son, Jesus, for his love for us, and for your precious Holy Spirit, who is with us. In your name we pray. Amen. Dear friends, my name is Judy Piper, and I am here representing our church's staff parish relations committee. Today, we are thrilled to welcome Reverend Susan Suarez Webster, who's been appointed as our associate pastor. We believe she is beyond well qualified and have prayerfully been appointed by our bishop, Paul Leland. Susan, you've been sent to live among us as a bearer of the word of God, a minister of the sacraments, and a sustainer of the love, order, and discipleship of the people of God. Today, I reaffirm this commitment in the presence of this congregation. Brothers and sisters in Christ, as a people committed to participate in the ministries of the church by your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness, will you who celebrate this new beginning support and uphold Susan in her ministry? We affirm, we affirm our, our commitment, commitment to, support to support you with, with our, our prayers, prayers, presence, gifts, service, service and witness. witness. Let us be in prayer. Eternal God, strengthen and sustain us in our ministries together with Jeremy and Susan as our pastors. Give them and us patience, courage, and wisdom so to care for one another and challenge one another Together, we may follow Jesus Christ, living together in love and offering our talents and gifts in your service. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Hi, my name is Kathy Miller, and I am here representing our church's leadership as the chair of our church council. Susan, we are now like we would now like to make several presentations to you, which are symbols of the ministry that we hope you will carry on among us. Susan, may you now accept this Bible and be among us as one who proclaims the word. Amen. Susan, take this water and baptize new Christians in this place. Amen. Amen. Susan, take this plate and this cup and keep us in communion with Christ and his church. Amen. Amen. Susan, use this hymnal to guide us in our prayers and our praise. Susan, receive this book of discipline and help us keep the covenant that strengthens our connections as United Methodists. Amen. Amen. Susan, receive this globe and lead us in mission to our community and into all of God's world. Amen. Susan, receive this stole, signifying your calling and your shepherd to us as our pastor. Amen.
This yoke has been laid upon me and I willingly take it upon myself. Will you pray with me? Lord, Lord God, God, bless the ministries, bless the ministries of, your, of church. your church. We, we thank, thank you for the variety of gifts you have bestowed upon us. us. Draw, Draw us together, together in one spirit that, that each of us may use our different gifts as, as members of one body. May your word be proclaimed with faithfulness, and may we be doers of your word and not hearers only. As we have died and risen with Christ in baptism, and as we gather at his table and then scatter into the world, may we be one in service to others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I thank the Lord for the opportunity to serve God and community here at Guilford College United Methodist Church. I look forward to meeting each one of you and also as we grow together in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, I know that we will be becoming better at knowing God and making him known in our community and among the nations. Thank you. Reverend Susan from the congregation, we bring to you this little token of our excitement and appreciation. These are all goods that are here from this community, this part of North Carolina. So welcome to Greensboro and this area. We're so thrilled you're here. Thank you so much. Let us now sing together our hymn of commitment. I'm going to live so God can use me. I'm going to live so God can use me anywhere, Lord, anytime. I'm going to live so God can use me anywhere, Lord, anytime. I'm going to work so God can use me anywhere, Lord, anytime. I'm going to work so God can use me anywhere, Lord, anytime. I'm going to sing so God can use me anywhere, Lord, anytime. I'm going to sing so God can use me Anywhere, Lord, anytime. Amen. Today, we're starting a new sermon series that we're calling Outside, Sermons Preached by God's Creation. One of the things you notice in the Gospels is that often when Jesus preached and taught, he took examples in his preaching and teaching from the natural world that was all around him. That's one of the reasons we hear Jesus talking so much about things like seeds and weeds and grain and birds and lilies. And so we thought it would be appropriate, especially in this time of summer, where so many of us are spending hopefully more time outside, and even if it's in the evening or in the morning or, or even on vacation, for us to think together about what are some of the things we see in God's world around us, in the natural world, that speak to us something about who God is. And so we hope during this series that you will take it as one of your spiritual imperatives to get outside, to spend more time outdoors, to intentionally notice the creation that God has made, 
and to listen for what it might be saying and to appreciate its beauty and goodness and complexity. Think of that as your devotional time during this month. Go outdoors. Don't shelter yourself inside. Turn off the phone, the electronics, and look to the world. We launched this outside series today by looking at Jesus's teaching, taking from the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 6, where he speaks of the birds and the lilies. As we have that read for us now, I invite you to listen for God's word, both through the scripture and also in the week ahead from the book of creation. Hi, church family. This is Josh Turner. I'm a rising senior here in the youth group at Guilford College United Methodist Church. And uh, join me as we read from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 6, verses 25 through 33. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life or what you will eat or what you will drink or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow, they neither sow nor reap nor gather into the barns and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of any more value than they? And can any of you work by worrying at a single hour to your span of life? And why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all of his glory was not clothed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow, and is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Therefore do not worry, saying, What will we eat, or what will we drink, or what will we wear? For it is the Gentiles who strive for all of these things. But indeed your heavenly Father knows that you need all of these things. But strive first for the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all of these things will be given to you as well. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Back in the spring of 1958, people all around the country, and especially bird lovers, noticed a really strange thing was happening. Spring had arrived, but the birds had not. There were hardly any cardinals. You had to look hard for robins. Swallows seemed to have disappeared. It seemed like songbird choir practice had been canceled for the spring. There was a nature writer named Rachel Carson who wrote a book about what was happening that she called Silent Spring. The title referred to the fact that that spring, the music of the birds had fled. Carson diagnosed the problem. Human beings had become so focused on killing insects with a harmful chemical called DDT that we had driven the birds away. Eventually, science showed that Carson was right and human beings changed things and the symphony of the songbirds returned and the spring was silent no more. Well, some of you know, this past spring, many people noticed the exact opposite phenomenon. It, it wasn't a silent spring, but it was a singing spring. As the coronavirus pandemic spread and people stayed at home, many folks noticed that the birds around them seemed to be singing louder this year. There were all these Google searches. Why are the birds so loud this year? Now, of course, the birds weren't necessarily singing any louder at all. But what happened was that with fewer cars on the road and fewer planes in the sky, with less air pollution and with us spending a little more time being still or walking outside or sitting on our porch or deck, we finally had the ears to hear what was happening around us all along. We were finally able to consider the birds. Once Jesus asked his followers to consider the birds. And when you think about it, that wasn't all that surprising a thing for Jesus to do. Because the truth is, there's some places where it seems like the Bible is literally a book for the birds. 
The first chapter of Genesis describes God as hovering over creation of all things like a mama house finch brooding over her nest. Among God's first words in the creation story are, let birds fill the sky and let birds multiply on the earth. Later in the biblical story, uh, a dove brings Noah a sprig of promise and quails feed the starving Hebrew wilderness wanderers and ravens fetch bread for a prophet. Within the Bible, sometimes even the birds of the air are used as an image of the very nature and character of God. Psalm 91 says that God is like a bird who shelters God's people beneath the shadow of her wings. And Deuteronomy 32 compares God to the eagle mother who stirs her eaglets out of the nest. The Gospels even paint the Holy Spirit as alighting on Jesus in the form of a dove. All that's to say that Jesus is continuing a long biblical tradition when he tells his followers to consider the birds and to think about what the birds might show them about God. Now, there's a famous story, maybe some of you have heard about St. Francis of Assisi. St. Francis was walking along, talking with some of his Christian brothers one day when they came upon this bevy of really loud and chirping birds. The others wanted to shoo the birds away or to hush them because they couldn't hear exactly what Francis was saying. But Francis stopped them, and instead of preaching to his friends, he just shifted to begin preaching to the birds. It's a scene that's remembered in some famous paintings from the Middle Ages. Francis basically said, Brother birds, you should greatly praise your Creator and be thankful to Him always, for He has given you feathers to wear and wings to fly and whatever you need. Brother birds, God made you noble among God's creatures and gave you a home in the purity of the air. Though you neither sow nor reap, God nevertheless protects and governs you without your least care. Well, Francis encouraged the birds to keep praising God. And according to legend, at least, the birds sat still and listened to his sermon. Maybe a, a Bob White even let out an ah, ah, men at the end of it all. Francis' sermon to the birds is one reason why so many statues of him have birds on, perched on his arms and on his shoulders. But Jesus suggests that maybe in preaching to the birds, actually Francis got it backwards. Maybe it's not we who should preach to the birds, but maybe it's we who should let the birds preach to us. I wonder what would happen if we took Jesus' advice and considered the birds for a moment. What kind of sermon might they preach to us? Consider, for instance, a hummingbird. A hummingbird is all by itself a kind of feathered and floating sermon about wonder and beauty in God's creation. The first European explorers to North America, they actually called hummingbirds flying jewels because of the microscopic arrangement of their feathers that refracts light as if a hummingbird were a kind of flashing rainbow. Brian Doyle adds that a hummingbird's heart is the size of a pencil eraser or of an infant's fingernail. And yet that tiny heart beats 10 times a second and has more power than any dynamo. That minuscule heart allows a hummingbird to dive at 60 miles an hour. That itty bitty heart enables a hummingbird to fly more than 500 miles without pausing to rest. That pint sized heart is enough to allow a hummingbird to visit a thousand flowers a day without getting tired. A hummingbird might preach to us that there is amazing beauty and wonder and power in even the smallest and seemingly most delicate of things. Or, rather than the hummingbird, what if we considered the great blue heron? That's my favorite animal and my spirit bird. I love the grace of a heron's flight. 
I love its poise, its patience, its stillness, even its shyness as it tiptoes carefully along the water's edge fishing. My heart skips a beat whenever I see a blue heron. There was a man named Wendell Berry who was out by the river one evening when he had a really memorable heron sighting. He watched as this great big blue heron flew down out of a tree over the river with all the grace of a dignitary coming down the stairs. And then Wendell Berry said, as soon as the heron got to the middle of the river without missing a beat, all of a sudden it did this extravagant loop-de-loop backflip in the middle of the sky. Wendell Berry said it was this most amazing thing to see because it was just so gratuitous and it just seemed to be the bird basically swooping and whooping it up for joy. And he said it made him realize that it's not just human beings who know what joy is, but there is this non-human joy all around us in the world, even in the lives life of a blue heron. A heron might well preach to us a sermon about how to be patient, but also about how to rejoice and to whoop it up. Or maybe consider a cardinal. I have two friends who had a cardinal preach to them once, or or maybe better put, they had a cardinal who acted as a chaplain to them. This married couple told me of how they once spent a long morning by the bedside of their dying mother. And soon after they arrived, even though it was snowing outside, they noticed a bright red cardinal perched on the branch of a tree just outside of the window. And all morning as they sat there holding the wife's mother's hand, that cardinal stayed right there through the snow and cold on that branch for hours right outside the window. Eventually the woman's mother took her last breath And almost immediately, the woman found herself looking out the window. At that same moment, the cardinal flew away. His watch was over. A cardinal might tell us that God sends all kinds of things as signs of God's presence with us. Once, Jesus told his followers to consider the birds. Only Jesus had a very specific message in mind when he said that the birds might preach to us? For Jesus, the message that the birds preach is how much God provides for God's world and how that means that we don't have to worry so much. Jesus said, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink or your clothing, what you will wear. Is not your life more than food and your body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And can any of you by worrying add a single hour to your span of life? I might paraphrase Jesus' words as study the ravens, meditate on a sparrow, They don't work to the point of exhaustion. They don't break a sweat. They don't farm. They don't plow dirt, sow seeds, chop out weeds, and then harvest the crop. They don't have to have a storehouse or barn or pantry or storage unit to store up all their food for the future. And yet there is daily bread for them as a kind of gift offered by the world. Sometimes even offered by people who set out food on their front porch. Warblers don't worry all the time about putting food on the table. And yet God feeds them. And you mean even more to God than a sparrow. So don't worry. God will provide for you too. Now, listen, if I were a bird, I might speak up or tweet up at that point in objection. Um, I might cry foul. I might say, now wait just a seed pick a minute, Jesus. That's a cheap shot. Ahem. We birds work pretty hard for our food. Haven't you ever heard that the early birds get the worm? You ever tried hunting caterpillars all day while also watching out for cats? 
You know how hard it is to regurgitate a creepy crawly from deep in your throat? You make it sound, Jesus, like bird just falls into our lap. But the truth is we have to worry about providing for ourselves too. And those birds have a point with their grousing. Did you know that birds actually have a really high metabolism and really high body temperature? Birds use a lot of energy. In fact, birds lose 10% of their body weight overnight every night. That means most of a bird's day has to be devoted to finding and catching and processing food in order to have the energy that they need. David Allen Sibley actually says that a single robin can eat about 14 feet worth of earthworms in a single day. 14 feet of worms! A group of chickadees can collect over a thousand small caterpillars in a day for their nestlings or hide away or hoard a thousand seeds. No wonder you have to spend so much on your bird feeder. Sibling says that based on body weight, if you or I ate like a bird, that means we would eat more than 25 large pizzas a day, which means maybe I do eat like a bird. So what does Jesus mean here about God feeding the birds? I don't think that Jesus is saying that birds have it all that much easier than we do. But I do think what Jesus says about birds shows us that he sees a different world than we do. When you and I look out on the world, we often see this dog-eat-dog world that is competition and survival of the fittest, where if things are going to work out for me, I have to do it. I have to have control. I have to earn it in some way. And when you see the world in that way, of course you are going to be anxious all the time because it really is up to you. But I think Jesus sees the world in a different way. I think Jesus sees a world that is not just a daily battle, but a world that is filled with daily gifts and daily bread that come from beyond us. I think he sees a world where we subsist by so many things that we do not earn and could never deserve. Where beauty and goodness happen all around us, even when we have nothing to do with it. Jesus sees a world where behind and through the processes of nature and of life, God opens God's hand like the old woman in Mary Poppins, to feed the birds and to dress the flowers and to provide for us, giving us what we most deeply need. That doesn't mean we don't still need to work and to provide, but it means that we are not alone in that working and providing. God is working with us. God is providing for us at the same time the chef to ravens and the tailor to lilies is with us too. When we realize that, we finally come to accept that the weight of the world is not on our shoulders alone. But there is a one who is so much bigger than us who is always looking out for us and we can learn not to worry too much. But y'all, what I've found in my own life is that I keep forgetting this. I need constant reminders that it's not all up to me. And I think that's another reason that Jesus tells us to consider the birds, that he tells us to do some bird watching. When I get trapped inside my own head, obsessing over my worries or anxieties, what happens is that I become oblivious to all of these good things that are right in front of me and around me. My worrying doesn't really accomplish anything. It doesn't change anything. It doesn't give me anything. But it does take something away from me. It takes away my ability to truly pay attention to what is right in front of me in that moment. It makes me blind and deaf. 
because I'm living in the past or because I'm fretting over the future, I can't perceive the present moment. So if I'm letting my worries take over my life, then the most awesome things could be happening for me and they wouldn't even register in my mind. The most beautiful bird could be perched right in front of my eyes and yet I wouldn't even see it. Or a wood thrush could be piping the most beautiful song up in that tree, but I would never even hear a sound because of all the noise and clatter in my mind. It might as well be a silent spring for me because my worries have polluted my mind and driven the birds away. If that's true, y'all, I wonder if the ability to hear and to see the birds around us is kind of like a diagnostic test for our soul. What if our capacity to see and to hear the birds around us tells us to what degree we have let our worries overwhelm us? Can a life that is too distracted to notice a bluebird really have enough room for God? Or can a mind too noisy to hear a mourning dove really hear God's still and small voice calling us? Back in the early 1900s, some of you know that miners used to bring canaries with them into the coal mines because the canaries were more sensitive than human beings to the presence of toxic carbon monoxide. If the birds disappeared or became sick or even died, it was like a flashing warning light to the humans that the mine shaft wasn't a healthy place for human beings to be. What if all birds are actually canaries in the coal mine of our world? And if we are living in such a way that we're no longer able to pause to hear them or to see them around us, then maybe it's a sign that it is not a healthy way for us human beings to live either as a people or as a person. And if that's true, then what if stopping and sitting still and getting outside our heads by looking for and listening for and considering the birds is an antidote to our anxiety. Y'all, there's a story in the Bible where God sends ravens to feed the prophet Elijah during a time of famine. Now, over the last few months, I haven't had any birds actually swoop up and bring me any food or pizza. But I think I have had birds who have ministered to me and preach to me just as much. I remember one night when I needed an escape from some of the pandemic, when I sat out on the deck and I watched swallows dance and twirl over a field, chasing bugs throughout the air. And it was so much more healing and therapeutic and even entertaining for me than ever watching anything on Netflix. In moments where the future has looked dark, there have been other times where I've peeked into the nest on our front porch where two baby house finch fledglings were preparing for their first flight. And they were a sign to me that new life was still being born and happening even with all so much illness and death around us. I would sit there on a bench and as those baby birds mama would come back to the nest with a wriggling worm in its beak, those baby birds would open their own beaks to their mama and they would go like this. More, more, more. And I thought to myself how in some ways that is an image of what prayer is. I can't get what I need on my own, God. I need only what you can give more, 
more. And when I've gotten lost in the dark and toxic mind shaft of my thoughts, I've been trying to go out for a walk in the fresh air. And as I do, I've started counting how many different colored birds I see. I bought a children's book that's helping me learn their specific names so that I won't be so blind anymore, so that I'll see more than just a blurry bird, but can see instead wrens and nuthatches and robins. I've even started listening to the recordings of bird songs because I don't want to be deaf to that either. I want to be able to hear and join in the praise music that God has queued up in the background every day of my life. I don't want my springs to be silent anymore. And y'all, I'm doing these things not just as a cure for boredom, but I'm doing it for my soul. Because somehow the more I do what Jesus said, and the more I consider the birds, the more I step out of myself and my own stupid worries, and the more I find my worries fly away, it's almost like it gives me a chance to get a bird's eye view of my life and to let this larger perspective sink in and to remember that God who opens God's hands to care for the birds around me will care for me too and for you too. Y'all want to close with, with this. There's a woman named Elizabeth Cheney who imagined once overhearing a conversation between a robin and a sparrow. The robin and the sparrow were taking a break from their labors and they were sitting on a branch with some binoculars doing some human watching instead of the other way around. And Elizabeth Cheney wrote down their conversation this way. Said the robin to the sparrow, I should really like to know why these anxious human beings rush about and worry so said the sparrow to the robin, friend, I think it must be. They don't trust in the same heavenly father who cares for you and me. Don't worry so much about your life, about the past, about the present, about the future. Instead, consider and listen to the birds of the air. God preaches sermons through them every day about wonder and about beauty and about joy and about presence and about provision. Watch out for the birds and let them remind you that the same heavenly father whose eye is on the robin and on the sparrow watches over you too. Amen. I sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free. His eyes on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. Why should I feel discouraged? Why should the shadows come? Why should my heart be lonely and long for heaven and home? When Jesus is my portion, my constant friend is he. His eyes on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. His eyes on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. I see because I'm happy. I seek because I'm free. His eyes on the sparrow, and 
and I know you watch us Let not your heart be troubled. These tender words I hear, and resting on his good words, I lose my doubts and fears. Oh, by the perfect but one step I may see is always on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. His eyes on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. I'd just like to remind all of you that we have our next blood drive coming up on um, July 23rd. I myself went ahead and got signed up to give blood. This is an important time when we, that are able, can collaborate in this effort. Uh, the instructions will be uh, going out uh, and it is online registration through Red Cross. Uh, at midday on Wednesdays, uh, we have a time of prayer, and we'd love to invite any of you to come. Your reservation would not be necessary for this Wednesday. Today at 2 o'clock, uh, you've received an email, I hope, that um, you can get on a Zoom call. You just need to uh, click on that link that's in the email from Jeremy, and um, we'll be able to celebrate the life of Jackie Fireball at 2 o'clock today. I look forward to celebrating her life, a life of joy, with you today at 2. Thank you so much. Let us now be blessed with this, the benediction. May the road rise to meet you. May the wind be always at your back. May the sun shine warm upon your face and the rains fall soft upon your fields. And until we meet again, may God hold you in the palm of his hand. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.